Today's sermon is titled, <clears throat> Loss, Holding On and Letting Go, to be delivered by Michael Esselin. Michael Esselin serves as the chaplain for the Sims Mann UCLA Center for Integrative Oncology. Two-time TEDx speaker, Michael speaks extensively to healthcare professionals, patient populations, and faith communities across the country. He's also worked as an active educator addressing anti-LGBTQ bias in the larger community for over 30 years. Michael was recently inducted into the UCLA Semmel Institute Eudaimonia Society in recognition of having lived a meaning-driven life. He has four volumes of CDs available for, for purchase. Contact Michael Esselin through his website, www.michaelesselin.com. And now, Michael Esselin. Good morning. The well-known Buddhist author and teacher Pema Chodron offers us this in her book, When Things Fall Apart. I used to have a sign pinned to my wall that read, only to the extent that we expose ourselves over and over to annihilation, can that which is indestructible be found in us. It was all about letting go of everything. I invite you to think about four or five things that make you who you are, that if anyone's going to know you at all, they're gonna know these four or five things about you, that you're a talented artist, you're a gifted athlete, you're passionate about politics or your faith community, you're a devoted grandparent. Maybe you're known for your beautiful physique and your great head of hair, that would be me. Imagine none of that is true anymore or not in the same way. Who would you even be then? Is there an essential you who dwells beneath all those labels to which we would attach ourselves, all those hats we might wear? What's more, is he or she worthy of love? Is he or she capable of giving love? As painful as it may be to pursue those questions, they do reflect the most profound spiritual journey through loss toward essence if you will, that which is indestructible. It's a journey that so many cancer patients must take in a compressed, accelerated kind of fashion, watching piece by piece of one's identity slip away. If I'm no longer the super mom who never misses a soccer game or a birthday party, who would I even be then? Would I even still be the mom? The thing is, it's a journey we all must take Life affords us each that guarantee that we will all lose everything. Everything that we are, everything that we have, everything that we love. How do we make peace with that? Is it even possible? I sometimes wonder if one key to living a successful life dwells within our capacity to come to peace with the inevitability of loss. What's more, might that peace even be a kind of gift, a blessing giving us a glimpse every now and then of that, which is indestructible. The Buddhists would caution us against grasping, holding on, to be well practiced at letting go, that reaching, grasping, clinging are sure pathways to suffering. As an illustration, we only have to look at how so many of us are coping with this unfolding pandemic. How long is this going to go on? I just want my old life back. When can we get back to normal? I'm an avid swimmer. I swim every day. I remember a year ago, last March, when my gym announced that because of the virus, they would be closing for up to two weeks. Two weeks? I can't live without the pool for two weeks. Oh, really? Just wait. I hear similar sentiments sometimes from newly diagnosed cancer patients. I just want my old life back. Can't we just go back to five weeks ago before all this ever happened? There's a kind of paradox, I think, that while yes, holding on can lead to suffering, <clears throat> I find there's also life force in it, in the reaching, in the yearning, in the striving. 
chemo infusion clinics are filled with folks who have signed up for guaranteed suffering for the possibility of more time, more life. Universities are filled with students investing in, striving for, creating a future. When we're young, the future is almost a member of the family, a character in our own biography. Look at how much attention and intention we invest in the future. It shapes almost every decision we make. As we get older, possibility diminishes right along with the future. And the past becomes a far richer member of the family, memories, stories, stories that can soothe us, bring us peace, stories that help us explain ourselves to ourselves or stories that might just as soon haunt us. But either way, stories that offer the possibility of meaning. In the saddest irony of all, some of us will even lose those in time. How do we make peace with that? Is there any meaning at all to be found in all that we will lose? I'm not so arrogant as to think I have any answers at all. What I have are stories. Both my own and those of countless patients, I've walked beside patients whom I would just as soon call my teachers. And I also have a growing faith at this stage of my life that growing closer, drawing closer toward any paradox, holding the space for two competing realities to be true, might just offer a pathway to peace, if not wisdom. April was a great gal mid-40s, vibrant, professional, a wife, a mom, two great kids. She had this exceedingly rare, exceedingly lethal cancer diagnosis that also happened to be horribly disfiguring. The doctors gave her that awful assessment, nothing more to be done. She greeted that news with this kind of clarity and profundity. Michael, I'm dying. I know that. It's the truth. But you know what? It's only one truth of many truths. Her openness to that statement, her willingness for it to shape the remainder of her days was truly something to behold. And there are those who cling so valiantly to those one or two aspects of one's identity that without them, life simply wouldn't be worth living. That clinging actually keeps them going. There's the passionate college professor who by any reasonable standard should never have been in a classroom, given how immunocompromised she was and how weak and frail she was. But even her oncologist saw the truth of her situation. I see this is who you are. You've got to be a teacher. So go teach, just be careful, okay? I remember years ago meeting a young woman, a young mother in her thirties in the hospital not long before she died. At the time I met her, she was busy keeping a journal, writing letters to her then 13 year old daughter to be read well into the future. Oh, that's so beautiful, I said, I'm glad you're doing it. No, it's not, she said, I, I'm just nagging her into the future, still just being a mom to the very end. Sometimes it might even be an object that we cling to with such defiance as some kind of touchstone, some remnant of this identity we just can't release. Maybe an old army uniform, maybe an old wedding dress, maybe an old ID badge from a long gone career. Over the last few years of my mom's life, she was acutely aware that things would be wrapping up soon. And so she took to earnestly cleaning out, clearing away every drawer, cabinet, closet in her house, letting go so we wouldn't have to. When death finally came, things had been pretty much sifted down to the bare essentials, except for boxes and boxes, acres and acres of family photos, cards, letters, a few tattered newspapers with historic headlines, JFK assassinated, that sort of thing. That last Saturday that we were packing up what was left of my mom's life, I made a final pass through her bedroom closet and in the darkness, high in the corner on the top shelf, I saw this dusty old hat box. How had we missed that? I pulled it out and opened it up. I couldn't believe my eyes. 
and I felt this searing stab of grief and of wonder. It was the hat, this hat that had become legendary in my memory, her Donna Reed hat, I called it. She looked just like her when she wore it. It was a little pillbox covered in champagne silk leaves, each one tipped with a little seed pearl. She bought the hat, I remember, to go with a light blue brocade suit that she would wear to her best friend Janet's second wedding in Las Vegas, maybe 1962 or so. My mom was quite the glamorous dresser in her day. Earlier that afternoon, in fact, we had come upon the photo of the wedding party in the original folder from the Desert Inn. There my mom and dad were seated at the table, looking so young, so handsome, so beautiful. I also knew that under the table were the most stunning pair of gold lame pointed toe stiletto pumps. I had always been fascinated with my mom's high heels, obsessed really. Even I knew better than to mess with those. But here it was, the hat. She had kept it. We had reminisced often about those years, even about that outfit, but she never let on that she had kept the hat for decades and decades and decades after letting go, saying goodbye to everything and everyone else, she kept that hat. Why? Did she need it as some kind of touchstone as proof that that time was real, that that aspect of her was still true? Unwilling to surrender this last souvenir. It leads me to wonder, what object will I cling to for no sensible reason as some kind of placeholder for some version of myself I will always want to claim as true, as a part of me? I don't know. David Foster Wallace says that everything I let go of has my claw marks on it. And there are those who adapt quite well to loss adapting to a new identity or a new version of the old one. Randy was a great guy in his mid fifties, had very advanced colon cancer. I had so many wonderful conversations with him over the last couple of years of his life. Not long before he died, I was walking him out of the clinic and we were still chatting when we got out in the hallway. Up walks another patient, gingerly making her way to the entrance of the clinic. She's on a walker. Randy says, just a minute, Michael. And he goes and he holds the door for her with a big smile on his face. There you go, sweetheart. And he came back to me and he said, you see there, Michael, the way I see it, that's my job now. To be kind. That's what I do. Now, cancer had robbed him of so much, but it hadn't taken away that career opportunity. He had been in a career that was animated by struggle and, co and competition, commercial real estate. It had all been refined and distilled now down to one who shows kindness. That's what he does. Cancer did not take away that opportunity. It didn't take away that place to still find meaning. Kate, in her early 60s, was diagnosed with a recurrence of breast cancer, now stage four. She was a spiritual seeker, an artist, a musician. She played cello in a local chamber orchestra. While raised an Episcopalian, she converted to Judaism much later in life, but not because of marriage or some such conventional reason, but because she said, I love the humor in Judaism. And besides, there's no hell. She also loved the questioning nature inherent in Jewish study. Although any articulation about who or what is God, how does prayer work, what happens after we die, was simply left undefined because she experienced her spirituality in community, playing music in community, praying in community. She didn't pray when she was alone. She also shared with me that she had been a survivor of childhood sexual assault an experience that left deep wounds to be sure, but not the least of which was a crippling fear of dying. And the essence of that fear 
Michael, what if I just disappear? There it is, ultimate loss, disappearance. I asked Kate if she'd ever had what any of us might call a peak spiritual experience. Oh yes, she said, playing a big lush piece of music like Handel's Messiah. I got to play that once in Cleveland, full chorus orchestra, the works. It was transcendent to be in the center of the creation of all of that music. Kate, you just told me that your biggest fear was that you would disappear. And yet your peak spiritual experience was one in which you disappear, if you will, into the creation of that music. It can't possibly be about you and your cello. And yet without that cello, the music would not have been the same. What if dying is like that? What if the other side is like that? Surrendering into this larger harmonic reality in which our voice is an inextricable piece of the whole. She sighed into that, she exhaled into that. Sometimes we might need to just summon our imagination to come up with new metaphors, new images when the fear of loss can just be immobilizing. I love to hike. And for decades, I have made a nearly annual pilgrimage to Yosemite because there's one hike there that has simply given me my life back more times than I can count. There's no other way to put it, often times of great distress. About a dozen years ago, I came upon such a time, devastation, really, a spiritual crisis, in fact, which I would define as a time of great loss. Everything that I had believed in and trusted collapsed right out from under me. At first, I thought maybe I ought to go to Yosemite, do that hike, try to climb out of it, transcend it. But it just didn't feel right. The more I thought, I thought, you know, you've always wanted to go to the Grand Canyon, hike to the bottom, never seen it, not getting any younger. What if I were to climb down into the sorrow, into the pain, into the earth, rather than try to climb out of it, see what might be there for me. So that's what I did. For any of you that have ever made that descent, you know how staggering it is. And the wisdom that came to me was so clear, clean, precise. The Grand Canyon is only grand because of what's been lost. Not because of one thing that's been added one particle of soil at a time, letting go, releasing itself to the water over the span of five million years, incomprehensible, swept away by something so simple as water. I spent that night at the Phantom Ranch at the bottom of the canyon. It's a charming, historic, albeit Spartan compound, dormitory-like cabins, communal dining room. That night, the lovely fellow who served us dinner asked for our attention before we dug in. He wanted to offer some kind of blessing or invocation. My friends, I wanna welcome you here. And while you're here, I hope you take time to be still, be quiet and feel the power of this place, the sacredness of it, the majesty of it. It's like Jerusalem or Mecca for the native people. He went on to say, and no matter how hard it was for you to hike down here today, hiking up tomorrow is going to be so much easier. And of course, there were incredulous groans from around the table. Yeah, right. And if not, he said, rejoice, rejoice, you got no choice. I love that. I come back to it again and again as a kind of mantra, rejoice, rejoice, you got no choice. What if, like the Grand Canyon, we are being carved out for our grandeur, hollowed out by loss, so that on our descent, we might catch a glimpse of that which is indestructible. Sure, let's savor each vista, cherish each moment, hold on, you bet. But with the lightest touch, and a willingness at any moment to let go. Except perhaps for that one thing. 
so be it.